to doing this conversation along 24 hours, this webathon, uh, and express our solidarity to people in Ukraine um, amid this uh, uh, important moment and tough moment. Um, I have played different roles in the B Corp movement as a B Corp founder. Uh, it's called Dynamo. It's, an, it's a venture builder of impact. So we have the past decade supported over 80 different startups of high social impact. All of them aligned with the 2030 agenda. And we have mobilized over $20 million for investing in these companies in a network of over 1,000 impact investors. We are pioneering crowd equity and blended finance in Brazil. And this is one of my, my roles here. I also co-founded the Sistema B in Brazil, which is the BLAB global partner in Brazil. And uh, we are currently one of the largest global markets of the B Corp movement, including over 250 certified B Corps and over 8,000 businesses using the BIA, the B Impact Assessment to measure and manage their impact. Currently, I am the head of global policy, uh, which is our strategy that I'll be more than happy to talk more uh, along our conversation. Thanks, Mark. Back to Welcome, you. Mark. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate you joining me. Now over to Paula. Pa Paula, can you give us your background, please? Introduce yourself. Definitely. Well, it's very hard to introduce myself after Marcel because he's done so, so much, but like, to be honest, he's very old. He doesn't look like, but he's like 70 years old. That's why he has achieved so much. <laughs> and with that being said, uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Paula. As you can probably, some of you notice, my native language is Spanish. I live in Argentina. However, I work in Sistema B uh, in the regional office, which is called Sistema B Internacional. Um, I don't want to start before, uh, I just want to say thank you for this invitation. I embrace this initiative, so we understand the context is extremely harmful and sad. I embrace uh, that you're doing this. Thank you for inviting us. We're definitely, together we're much more uh, than the, the sum of the parts, right? Uh, so as I was saying, I live in Argentina, precisely Patagonia. I don't, it's very, very far that south, right? I don't know if you've been there, it's a paradise of nature. And I work in Sistema B Internacional, supporting 19 countries in Latin America. Uh, precisely, I lead, uh, I support the policy strategy along with Marcel, which is like my mentor, I'd like to say in that area. <laughs> and also develop partnerships, uh, purposeful and meaningful partnerships for our network. And well, that, that is as much as I would like to share so that we, that we dig into the conversation. Perfect, Paola. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Bob. And Chris, over to you, my friend. Thank you, Bart. Um, <clears throat> and yes, echo the thanks for the, the invitation. And, and it's, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's special to be, to be to be doing something um, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, let's echo um, Bart's encouragement to, to everyone to, um, to, to donate uh, if you're watching this. Um, I'm Chris Turner, I'm the Executive Director of B-Lab UK, which as you would imagine is the um, British um, global partner growing the B Corporation movement here in the UK. I'm uh, dialing in from, from London. Um, we, the UK, B Corporation community is um, uh, the fastest growing in the world. We've just, as of yesterday, we've hit 800 B Corps in the UK, um, which is uh, which is very exciting. Um, and I'm also the uh, campaign director of the Better Business Act, which is the um, policy uh, campaign that we launched just over a year ago in March um, last year. Um, when we're campaigning um, through the Better Business Act for mandatory um, stakeholder governance here in the UK. So I can speak a little bit to why we've, uh, why we've gone in um, for that sort of world first approach and, and some of the uh, progress that we've been making along the way. But I'm looking forward to um, uh, hearing from everyone else more than I am to telling you about that. So it should be a good conversation. Thanks, Chris. And so you're, you're going to be first up on my hit list, Chris. I'm starting with you, my friend. And I'm just going to make sure that we set some context for the people who are with us, knowing that not everybody knows what B Lab is or what a certified B Corporation is. 
So let's just start with the beginning. What is the B-Lab global network? What are we trying to uh, achieve as a global movement? All right, but I'll give it a crack. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the, the pressure of being asked that question by one of the founders of the whole global movement. I'll, I'll, try, and, I'll try and bear that burden. Um, the, so the B, B Corporation um, is, is many things. It's many things to many people because it, 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 I, I guess the most, um, the most obvious and compelling thing is that it's a movement. You know, it's a, it, I think that for me, that's always been one of the most exciting things about B Corporation is that it's about people. Um, and, and, you know, people, um, people are the heart, the beating heart of any movement. And, and the B Corporation movement is ultimately comprised of, a, a, well, thousands, many, many thousands of people around the world who are, in, in one of our many catchphrases, using business as a force for good. And they might be doing that by working for a business that's certified as a B Corporation. They might be doing, doing it by creating a business that, that is certified as a B Corporation. They might be doing it by investing in B Corporations, um, or, or, or indeed they might be doing it um, in their role as citizens and consumers by buying from B Corps and, and using them um, in their lives. So it is really a, a, a very broad, um, global, um, inclusive movement. Um, at the heart of that movement, are, as I've alluded to, the businesses that are certified as B Corporations. So what, what the B Corp certification does is it takes a pretty, pretty holistic um, look at the, the operations of a business um, and um, businesses themselves do that through a self-assessment and um, they get a score. Um, and they get a score which, um, uh, when it reaches a certain threshold of 80 points, grants them the ability to um, apply for that that score to be verified, um, which will then enable them to become a certified B Corp. And that's one of the two central kind of criteria or pillars for becoming a B Corporation is that verified score of 80 points. The other um, key criteria for becoming a, a certified B Corporation is, is the one where perhaps we're going to spend a little bit more time on today, which is the um, what we call the mission lock. It's essentially the way in which a business um, enshrines the principles of stakeholder governance into its governing principles or articles. And that might be, that might take the form, it depends where, where you are around the world, um, where BART sits in the US, um, a business would need to incorporate as a benefit corporation um, in order to do that. Where I'm sitting in the UK, a business um, needs to more simply amend its articles of association but whatever form it takes, it needs to be a kind of legal, formal commitment to, to these principles of stakeholder governance. So when those two things come together, the, the um, assessment, the verified assessment, proving that a business is walking the talk and doing um, the hard work necessary to bring those principles to life is combined with the formal lasting um, commitment to stakeholder governance at the very highest level of the business, then that that's where the magic happens. I think in, in, I, I, I like to think it's really the combination of those two things which makes the B Corporation certification so special. Um, and so that, that, that um, community of certified businesses is really the foundation. It's the, it's the beating heart of that movement that I was talking about in the beginning. There are over 5,000 B Corporations around the world now um 150 odd industries so really kind of running the gamut of, of all the all the different types of business you can imagine in over 80 countries um so truly global um and the idea there is that that the um the the, the businesses we certify they grow the movement they raise the profile of what it is that we're trying to do what it is what, that we're trying to say which is that we need to see um, we need to see an ec economic system which is more inclus inclusive, it's more equitable, it's more regenerative. Um, and, and ultimately, um, the progress that we've seen, that BART has seen more than the rest of us, because BART was there at the very, very beginning. I think the progress that we've seen and the acceleration of that progress in more recent years since I joined in 2019 is really testament to the fact that this is a, it's an idea, not just people say an idea whose time has come, don't they? It's not just an idea whose time has come, but it's an idea that which is more um, uh, necessary and imperative than, than, than ever. Um, and so that maybe serves as an intro, but I don't know what you're gonna ask next. So I should stop talking and let you get another question in.
It's perfect. It's a perfect setup for Marcel. Marcel, you are up next, my friend. And fundamentally embedded in this movement to try to you know, get more people to use business as a force for good and create a more, as Chris said, inclusive, equitable, and regenerative economic system. We have a policy agenda. And I'd love as the head of global policy, Marcel, for you to enlighten the, our friends just what that policy agenda is and what we're trying to accomplish with it. Thanks, Bart. Um, I'll try to be inspired by the elegant way how Chris introduced the Big Corp movement. Um, as Chris, Chris highlighted, we just achieved 5,000, over 5,000 certified Big Corps in the world. It is, it is a remarkable number. Uh, although we all acknowledge that it is not enough to achieve this vision of new economic system that is more inclusive, equitable, and regenerative. So according to the World Bank, there are 125 million businesses in our planet. So how can we empower all of them to behave like a B Corp with purpose, accountability, transparency? So one of our main global strategies today is about policy change. It's about changing the rules of the game so all businesses can behave like a B Corp. So the policy strategy is uh, basically our approach to lead, coordinate, and promote policies, uh, legislations, and self-regulations that foster uh, stakeholder governments. Because we believe that it's no possible to talk about stakeholder capitalism or stakeholder economy if we do not build infrastructure for that. And that's what stakeholder governance means. It's about legal accountability. It's about including stakeholders in the decision-making. It's about value creation for all. So basically, this strategy, uh, we started a few, uh, actually 10 years ago in the US with a strategy to uh, uh, create a new corporate legal form called Benefit Corporation. Uh, in the past decade, we have passed this legislative proposal in over 50 different jurisdictions. So it, it's been very well embraced and adopted by not only the business sector, but also from the capital markets in which I believe we will have more opportunity to talk about. So it's quite important to understand that if we shape the institutions to uh, consider that businesses is not only about uh, maximizing uh, shareholder value or maximizing short-term profits to one single stakeholder, but instead it's about creating long-term value for all stakeholders. So we need to change the mindset, we need to change the culture, change the structure and change the behavior. And that's why policies are important because we can shape institutions to the challenges and the opportunities that we have for this century and meet global goals, including 2030 Agenda and Paris Agreement. Beautiful. Thank you, Marcel. So, Paolo, we're now we're getting into the heart of it, right? So we have kind of the context. And the truth is, this is one of the places that B-Lab, and I'm going to serve a little bit as uh, the naysayer in the crowd as we go through the rest of the, the, uh, the questions. And, and Paula, not everybody believes that we need to upend shareholder primacy to fundamentally reach stakeholder capitalism. Why do you think it's so critical that we change the rules of the game, as Marcel said? True, but not everybody believes that we need to change uh, the rules of the game, right? <laughs> Amazing. Well, in our B movement, we believe so. Um, honestly, in all, in all true, today is the ruling system, right? Like the shareholder primacy rules globally. Thankfully, this is changing as Marcel and uh, Chris were like elaborating on the, the benefit corporation like burst that is happening. And also like conscious level races globally. Uh, so this is slowly starting to change, but it is still today the dominant system. And the shareholder primacy beyond uh, the objective uh, to maximize a short-term profit to a single stakeholder, right? The shareholder. Uh, the shareholder primacy is supported by an economic system based in extract extractivism, resource scarcity, uh, extreme concentration of wealth, 
so the equation is pretty obvious, so change is never easy to face. Uh, so that is why we believe we need to change this like on the other way, right? Um, on the other hand, our vision in the B movement is also about inclusion, right? Above equity and regeneration. But inclusion, I think it comes, it's very easy to see that it's not spotted in this system. Very few, this is the, like the opposite of inclusion, very few make decisions uh, impacting the massive amount of countries, communities, natural resources, and, and also like Marcel was saying, impacting the, the policy making where uh, we have, of course, the direct impact in, again, extractivism, the use of resources, the land, and very few and basically um, big power players in the economic market influence the decision-making process that also affects directly more, actually, the non-involved in the decision-making process, uh, which are the rest of the shareholders, right? Uh, from that point, also, I wanted to connect something that happens, it's very strong in our region, but I happen, unfortunately, to have seen in conversation with other partners, global partners in the rest of the world that is happening in other regions as well, is the lack of response uh, from public institutions to demands, the needs uh, of the greater common, right? Uh, the good for the, for the common, for the rest of the community. Again, big economic powers make the decisions influ influence in the decision making policies. Um, so this is something that we need to like review from the scratch. And I think that again, it's slowly it's slowly taking place, but I think it is taking place and it's becoming more much more obvious. And it's something that I think we can elaborate more and Marcel is an expert here uh, with the market capital being driven towards that direction. Um, but I think that if we don't change that perspective, we're still going to like reframe nicely with a green package, this dominant uh, finite system that is ruling. So I'm going to, again, playing the naysayer, Paul, I'll buy the fact that we indeed need to change the rules. But I guess, Marcel, I'm going to come back to you. I thought if I read carefully lots of corporate law, you already can consider stakeholders. Like I know you can here in the United States. And as I've gotten more familiar with uh, corporate law in the UK and uh, the European Union, and frankly, in many of the Latin American contexts in Australia, you already have the ability to consider all the other stakeholders. Why do we need a new law? Like, why are we going through all of that work when it already exists? Like we can just Consider them already. Thanks for asking this, Bart. Uh, yes, you can consider stakeholders in many jurisdictions uh, in, in using uh, some legal words, uh, both common law or civil law. You have different jurisdictions that do allow you to consider stakeholders in your decision making. But here we are talking about culture shift. Here, we are talking about a new social norm. And currently, that's not the culture. That's not the norm. That's not how businesses have done. Otherwise, probably, we would have different results. We have had, in these uh, last 50 years, a tremendous uh, wealth generation. At the same time, one billion people have left the extreme poverty since 1980, according to the World Bank. The uh, Friedman Doctrine, which is uh, about businesses, the, the business of business is business. The main social responsibility of business is to maximize profits. This doctrine created a massive wealth. There is no discussion about that. However, at the same time, this doctrine also has created a massive social distortion and uh, environmental negative impact. So acknowledging that we have to shape these institutions, we have to shape a new culture shift, a new social norm, and we have a tremendous sense of urgency. Because if we depend on voluntary change, probably we won't meet the needs that we have in both planets and society. So we need to change regulations, change policies, change self-regulations so we can foster the adoption of stakeholder governance. So we can definitely take stakeholders into account 
in the decision making and definitely do not de generate wealth for one single stakeholder, which is the shareholder, but to all stakeholders included in the value chain. It is truly uh, uh, a, 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 uh, uh, an outcome that I believe that the post-pandemic world uh, is composed by those companies that create value for all. Those companies that embed the positive impact in their value chain, in their work environment, in their business model. And that's uh, the culture that we all see at the Big Corp movement. Super helpful, Marcel. And, and to follow up to you, uh, Chris, please go ahead. I saw a hand go up. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to, I mean, I've just got loads to say on this because, um, you know, I, I guess we've, I guess we've been answering this question quite a lot with the Better Business Act campaign in the UK because we've been, because we're not campaigning for, for an option, you know, and, and we, we're, we're campaigning for the mandatory change or, the, or uh, we say the default um, because mandatory makes it sound like a sort of, you know, a burden. Um, whereas actually I think default is a more appropriate framing. Um, and the first thing I would say, but in response to your playing devil's advocate there is, is, is to sort of say, um, yes, businesses can choose to do this, um, but in what world should they be able to choose not to do this? Um, it's mad um, to, to think that businesses should be able to choose um, to disregard the interests of a wider set of stakeholders and, and in effect, and in, well, in stark practice, do harm to a broader set of stakeholders. And not only can they choose to do that in the current system, they are indeed by default, um, you know, set up to do that and indeed incentivized to do that. So I think I would flip it in that way, first of all, and to say that there is not just a, a need to, um, there is not just a need to highlight the fact that it is currently an option, which does need to happen. Um, and indeed, that's part of the role of the B Corporation movement. There is a need to remove the option to behave in the way that is currently the orthodoxy and the default. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. Um, it, there's, there's maybe I can just offer um, one more um, sort of take on this, which is to say that the um, we we kind of I, I think I sometimes say that actually when we talk about what we're what we're proposing here. Um, there's a sort of um, there's a dark there's a dark and a light um, to to um, the the kind of benefits that we would see. So on the dark side, um, I think what what I would say is that in um, making this the default or the mandatory, what you are doing is you are taking away what is a hiding place for people who want to do bad things. Right? They can hide behind the cover of the existing legislation to say. I'm just living up to the kind of, you know, my responsibilities in, in law. And so that's that. But I think then there's the light side, which I mean, we can talk about all this in more detail, but on the light side, I think in, in reframing these um, responsibilities and the role of business in, in our society in this way, in a, in, in a, in a way which demands um, a, a much more positive role um, for all of us, I think, what we and I, I not only do I think I see with our 800 B Corps in the UK with with the 5,000 around the world, you see the incredible potential that can be unleashed when these these simple kind of operating principles are in place. Um, the the incredible innovation, the incredible um, humanity um, that can be unleashed um, from all these businesses if you if you set these these principles straight and if and if you just let businesses run with them um, you know they're incredible machines of creativity and innovation and problem solving and we've just set them up with the, with the wrong code um, the wrong algorithm um, and and so we need to correct that and and we see it with our community but I think we also saw it in the pandemic for example and I think we're also seeing it in Ukraine you know, when business is faced with, you know, these really kind of stark and, and critical challenges, then, you know, ones which are um, ones which are kind of constructed in the right way or led by people with the right sort of mindset and, and have the right kind of culture ingrained, to your point about culture, Marcel, then you unleash something which is truly remarkable. 
Chris, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with you for a second. I'm going to put together Marcel's comment and yours. And so Marcel, what I understood you to say is that we have an existing set of laws that have been passed in 50 jurisdictions that makes stakeholder consideration mandatory, right? It makes it required for every company that opts in and becomes a benefit corporation or that similar like. And so it changes how they approach stakeholder consideration and changes their purpose and if, therefore it affects their culture. And so that's what's passed so far. And Chris, I think you're talking about another layer of mandatory, right? And I want to come back to the Better Business Act. And can you just make sure the audience understands how the Better Business Act is different than the other 50 pieces of legislation that have already passed? And, it, and if I'm a company in Delaware and I choose to be a public benefit corporation, I choose to do it. I must consider my stakeholders. How's the Better Business Act different? Sure. Yeah, so the, the Better Business Act takes exactly the same principles as, as benefit. Well, not exactly, but, you know, it's, it's, the, same, it's the same thing in terms of saying um, that, that businesses, you know, should be, should be accountable to, to, uh, to stakeholders rather than, than just shareholders. And, and what it does is, is it takes that and, and what we've done is we found a way um, in, in UK corporate law um, of making that apply um, to every single business in the country. So what we're going to do is we're going to take Section 172 of the Companies Act, which um, everyone can frantically Google now, um, and it, it is the section of the Act um, of UK corporate law that deals with directors' duties. And what it says at the moment, essentially, is that the, um, the, the, the duty of directors is, to, um, uh, is, is essentially to its members, which is shareholders. Um, and it says that, that those directors should have regard to a broader set of stakeholders, um, but that's it. And obviously, um, in the current framing, what that means is, uh, and in many cases, um, what that means is that directors regard and then they can disregard. Regard can be a fleeting consideration. And what we're doing is, we, is, is we're proposing a change to that language, which says that um, directors um, must align the interests of shareholders with those of wider society and, and the environment. So we call this aligned interests. It's one of the four principles of our act. We say they must align the interests of shareholders with society and the environment. The second of our four principles is that we want to do this by empowering directors. So that by using this section of, of corporate law in the UK, what we're, what we're saying is that we're relying on essentially the same principle which, is, which sits at the heart of corporate law already, which is that of faith, good faith in, in directors and in their judgment. And people say to me, uh, Chris, doesn't this make directors' jobs incredibly difficult because they've got to suddenly be weighing up, you know, all these sort of interests? Say, so, yes, it should be. <laughs> you know, directors, you know, have, have a huge responsibility. They carry a huge amount of power. Um, and of course, as the business grows, that responsibility grows. And so why on earth should the job not be um, more difficult than it is now? Um, and, and so, it, it, you know, we, it's a well-established principle that we're relying on. And, and indeed, I think what we're doing is we're kind of upgrading that principle to reflect the true responsibilities that directors um, have. The third of our principles is, is that it needs to be the default. So this is back to your question, Bart. What, what, what it means is that by... Um, changing this section of the Companies Act just immediately on the passing of that act, these responsibilities will apply to the directors of every single business in the UK. Um, so it will become what we say, what we the way we refer to it is it becomes a new level playing field, you know, for, for every single business in the UK. So by choosing to operate in this way, you're not disadvantaged uh, in any way, you know, compared to those businesses who want to just cut you know cut costs and pursue profit and short-term return so um and then our fourth fourth principle is about reporting and that these responsibilities need to be reflected in in reporting to make sure there's some some accountability there so that's that's what we mean when we talk about the the mandatory um of the better business act well, i gotta ask chris you know as the financial well, if not the financial capital of the world one of the financial capital of the world's the home of venture capital where it was originally founded this feels radical. Like, how is it going? Is this being picked up? 
It is. Um, so as I say, we're a year, year and a bit in. Um, and we've what we've been doing is we've been um, uh, constructing this as a business led campaign. So it's all very well me turning up to Parliament and saying, I've got a great idea um, because uh, I wouldn't be taken very seriously. Um, what, what, what we need to do is we need to bring business leaders um, to, the, to that table to, to be able to say, I run a business and I run a business on these principles. And what it means is I'm not only um, making the world a better place, but I'm, I'm growing a, I'm growing quickly and I'm growing a resilient business and I'm, you know, attracting great people and all of the other benefits that come with running a business in this way. And so we've, we've been building a coalition of businesses to support um, the campaign. We've been throwing a lot of impressive numbers out. Here's another one. We've got 1, 000, over 1,200 businesses um, signed up to that coalition supporting the campaign here in the UK. We've also got partner organisations supporting the campaign, including the Institute of Directors, which is a sort of, you know, kind of um, storied institution in the UK representing tens of thousands of company directors. Um, and, and we've got, um, ultimately, we've got a real cross section of, of, you know, the same kind of diversity we have in the B Corp community, businesses of all sizes all over the country, all supporting this. And what we've done is we've, we've um, kind of harnessed that coalition over that last year and a bit to, um, to run events, to meet with parliamentarians, to attract media interest and coverage. Um, and we, we've, we've had, I think, getting on for, I think we've had over 150 pieces of coverage in the media with, you know, the FT and the Times and the Guardian, you name it, um, as well as international coverage in the Washington Post and Bloomberg and here, there and everywhere. So loads of attention on the campaign. It is, a, you know, it's a world first, um, but also, um, uh, we've 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 met with dozens and dozens and dozens of parliamentarians, and so we've got support from members of parliament in every single party in Westminster, um, which is so important for showing that this isn't a political issue. You know, this isn't partisan. It's not. You know, it doesn't sit on one side of, of an aisle or, or a spectrum. Um, what it is 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 common sense. What it is is um, you know the law catching up with where um culture is where business culture is and and, and 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 indeed actually with where corporate governance needs to be if business is to meet some of the obligations that are being increasingly placed on business by other pieces of reporting and legislation in the uk particularly businesses are are being um faced with a huge amount of report you know tcfd reporting requirements a huge amount of reporting and regulation which at the moment is all kind of running counter to these directors' duties, you know, everything they're being told to report on is saying you're responsible to all these other stakeholders, while their core duties of directors are saying you're only responsible for these for these shareholders. So um, that's landing. It's landing with <laughs> with the lawmakers who recognise that that this is not just needed. It's not just crucial for for the change we need to see, but it's also absolutely a way of um, you know making uh, I suppose rationalising um you know some of some of the the um the sort of yeah the the regulation and changes that are need that are happening now and will be needed in in, in an increasing volume in in the years to come it's, it's phenomenal and exciting and, and paula i i see a small challenge in there you dropped world first talking about the united kingdom you know come on what's happened down in latin america let let the, the crew know uh how, how we're doing in latin america how nice everything that you're doing, Chris. Would you like to come here, uh, down and share your experiences? <laughs> like, I was so enthusiastic, like about to share all the things that we achieved, and now I feel so, like there's so much more to be done. <laughs> We're so much behind in so many conversations. It's like challenging, but it's great that we can share all these experiences. I mean, Latin America is huge, and it's already like very different, like the the context among the region. So let me give you. Um, a little bit of context uh, where we're standing. So the, the, the act, uh, we call it Big Benefit Interest Corporation, right? So the law, the, the Big Act has passed already in five countries. I mean, I think two weeks ago, Panama was the fifth one. So we're very happy about that. The first one was Colombia in 2017. Uh, then came Ecuador, then Peru, 
recently last year, Uruguay, which passed the law and just now implemented and now Panama. And many others are like just there, right there, right? I'd like to say to point out that in most of the conversations, Sistema B, you know, the B movement is there engaged. They come to us to ask about standards and accountability and transparency and what about the triple impact. So there is a lot to be done there. And um, so we have these five countries. The interesting thing is that when one country passed the law, the second one came and the first one, Colombia was saying, wait, wait, wait don't pass the law, but don't. Like there are many, just beware of this and this. So we are starting to work together. We started a few years ago to work together to share these lessons. And countries and policymakers understand that this is the way to go. And they're very enthusiastic to bring this into the, the Congress and the chambers. But they're not really that ready. There's a lot to be done in uh, accountability, in reporting, right? And what does it take? What does it need uh, a company to become a benefit corporation? So I, and Marcel, correct me, I think you have this figure more accurate, but I think that at the point where about 2,000, more or less 1,800, 2,000 benefit corporations or, or companies being signed under this legal framework, right? It keeps growing. So we're very happy about that. About that. However, we are very um, aware that many conversations need to be held. And again, in most cases, they come to us. So we serve as a, a conversation table for these policymakers. Um, something interesting that to share came to mind just now. Uh, a, um, coming back to the beginning of the conversation that we were talking about shareholder uh, governance, right? You know that uh, I think it was 2019 that in a big day in Mendoza, where we gather NGOs, regular citizens, consumers, policymakers, purpose driven companies, B Corps, started talking about what not to push to um, and, uh, promote the sustainable triple impact we would call uh, public purchases. And there was one lawyer, which was now we call impact lawyers. So no, no, we said, come on, draft, draft an idea how it will be a public purchase um, with, with purpose look like this framework. So he started drafting this and this was not only passed, but also shared regionally. And now they, they created a, a world, a global platform for sustainable, sustainable public purchases, right? Governmental uh, purchases. So I think it's a very clear example to illustrate what we were speaking about in the beginning when we we gather shareholders view um, is more, more inclusive, reach uh, the output, right? The result. So this is the context. Five already passed, uh, implemented most of them. Many in Argentina, we have, for example, not implemented just yet, but we have not one proposal, but four. So when we were Chris was speaking about this, is not partisan. I was like, in some cases, it still is, right? Unfortunately, and they're still like, you know, nobody wants to say, give in to the other ones. It's not, no, they wanted to have like my name on it. So unfortunately, it's not moving forward. However, as we're learning, we need to be very careful in what is being passed, approved. So we're good that they don't move forward as long as they move forward with something that is really consistent and we don't fall again into the next same trap. Like remember like the, the sustainable label uh, because we're learning, we, were, we, we gathered last week in this big, uh, this big movement gathering Be Good For Leaders um, and we were sharing with one company, uh, a Colombian company, they say, so you're a big company, right? You're, you, you're under that framework. There are also big corps. Yeah. So what did, you, what did you need to submit in order to become, oh, just nothing, just I feel the form. Like, yeah, but like what type of information? No, 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 no like what do you mean? Like, nothing. Not just my name. Like, so you sign that form and you're already, so we need to be engaged in that conversation before it gets like the new way, the sustainable uh, way that we're all sustainable, we're all regenerative and many hide under that umbrella, right? Um, so what we're also pushing, given that context, we gathered uh, in 2021, and thanks to 
one of the, the, the upsides and up downs in the pandemic was all this possibility to do these global and regional gatherings by Zoom. So we hosted a public policy summit. It was a public, it was a, um, a triple impact public policy, right? And it was an amazing turnout. More than 18 countries came, more than 1,200 participants from all the region. And that was striking, uh, was striking was the fact that 40% were from public sector. So imagine the fact to gather like so many representative public policy makers curious about what is to sanction, what is that talk about a triple impact uh, framework, legal uh, public policy. So this is what we hosted last, last year. And the, um, the result was, again, the metrics were very good, but not only we, we mapped uh, the impact and many policymakers took, took this to these chambers. And we know this again, because all the, law, the network of impact lawyers and all the country partners that are engaging in these conversations could see how these policymakers were taking these conversations into their chambers. Um, so again, this ecosystem building about public policies is very, I mean, enriching. Um, one anecdote, what fun anecdote that we have one, one president, just, just a president, a country president was speaking about the benefit program, like the, these companies under the benefit uh, framework. And they was calling like the B Corps, when you're a B Corp, it's not the same. So imagine like the, how um, renowned are we and how important it is also for us to be there in that conversation to know the difference about a B Corp, a benefit corporation. Uh, and transparency matters. So that was a very fun anecdote. A president, like he, he, I think he said like B Corp 10 times within a, a minute without that video. Um, so we did that public policy uh, summit last year. And well, the, the approach that we took last year, I think in many cases we're taking that approach is like um, from big to small, right? For a very focused conversation with policymakers and impact lawyers or subject matter experts. Uh, what we're doing this year is um, we're doing small, or a company, we're not doing them in, what we accompany them in some cases, we organize them, what we call national observatories. These are working table, conversation tables among policymakers in function, right, in, in, in duty. Uh, these experts and system based representatives, mostly the executive director or the policy director to talk about how to implement, what to be mindful about, what is not working out. Uh, for example, Ecuador is already presenting uh, a first uh, amendment to that law, considering all the mistakes that they were foreseeing, that they, that they experienced. So they're coming up to that. So we, the five countries, well, one is very recent, three already have this observatory. So what we did, is we did a regional, conversation table and we're hosting one in the next semester with these policymakers but very intimate we really care because we when we open it they start with they start with these very public speeches and we did a very in focus about intimate and honest conversation what is not working out and it was very very enriching conversation like about the problems that they're having how to tackle those problems you know benchmark and share lessons and on the third, um, on a, a third like line of work that we're doing, uh, also ecosystem building, not only leading from Sistema B, from, from um, a more um, representative approach, we're doing roadmaps of public policies in 11 countries of Latin America. We're working with experts, also uh, UNPD, Penu, um, and Sistema B, and GRI also is being part. In 11 countries, we're drafting roadmaps for public policies, but we're also raising these policymakers so that they carry these roadmaps in impact investment, benefit corporation, and public purchase of triple impact. So that is our approach at the moment. Our hands are full, as you can see. Indeed, indeed. And I got to call you about the procurement preference down in Argentina. I want to learn more about it. I didn't, that's spectacular. But I did see, Marcelo, you raised your hand in the center of what Paulo was talking. Did you have something to add? I have a separate question for you, but do you have something that you wanted to add? 
No, very, very briefly, uh, that, uh, well, public procurement is very important in the region because it represents 15% of the regional GDP. So governments definitely are important market players. But uh, the point that I wanted to add is about how we have engaged also capital markets in the region. And, uh, and uh, I, I think the case that we, we've uh, designed with the Sao Paulo Stock Exchange is very uh, inspiring because that has created an, an important opportunity for large enterprises and publicly traded companies pursue not only the big corp certification, but pursue the stakeholder governance model. So uh, we, uh, we have done different steps uh, with capital markets. Uh, one of them is to embed in the corporate sustainability index, which is an existing index for 18 years in Sao Paulo Stock Exchange, uh, which is composed by almost 50 publicly traded companies summing up around $500 billion in market cap. So basically what we did, we uh, included uh, some big corp elements in the disclosure questionnaire of those listed companies. That created some kind of conversations in capital markets and these companies uh, started using the BIA, the big impact assessment to manage their impact. And also they started adopt the big corp legal language in their bylaws even though they were not B Corp. So they uh, voluntarily, they started shaping and shifting their culture. So it's, it's quite interesting. That's the concept of self-regulation when the market itself started regulating itself and eventually it become new policies or legislations. So that's what we've seen. And from this experience, we've, uh, from the global perspective, We've now engaged other stock exchanges to create what we have called benefit index. So that's an opportunity to engage publicly traded companies, capital markets to behave like a benefit corp, behave like a B corp with purpose accountability and transparency. We are prototyping this initiative of benefit index in three different continents. If we succeed, I am sure we will have critical mass to be in the core of the capital markets and change it from inside out and move important part of capital, important amount of capital to not only go to ESG investment, but to stakeholder capitalism. Love it. Thank you, Marcel. Chris, I got a question for you. And so there's been a there's been beautiful advancement around uh, public reporting and disclosure right, with the work coming out of the EU with EFRAG and what's happening in, at the ISSB and what we're seeing from the SEC, and it's fantastic energy. And I hear from many people, like, if we could just get a disclosure, everything else will follow. And I know I'm biased that I think governance has a part to play in it, but I'm, I'm curious, like, that's a current debate that's being had right now. Will disclosure get us there, or is there another element we should be talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot to this. I mean, I think the you know it, it, it's a little bit like the um, you know they, they, let me let me compare this this question with a, a question about um, uh, you know I mentioned earlier you know the the shifting business culture. I, this I know this isn't true everywhere, but in the UK you know, business culture is shifting, you know, the expectations of, of, you know, let's call them consumers, although we'd rather they weren't consuming so much, um, you know, the expectations of consumers, the um, rise of ESG in investing, you know, the, all of this means that actually the, the culture of business is shifting and the expectations are there that, that businesses should be, should be doing more and more in terms of having a positive impact and, and being accountable to a wider set of stakeholders. And so there is an argument to say we don't need we don't need legislation. We don't need policy. It's happening. Um, and actually what you do, you know, policy is, well, it's just not necessary, basically. Um, I think, so, so I, would, I would draw parallels between these two. Um, you know, they, they are both, they are both sort of, um, they're both necessary. And without them, 
the stakeholder, you know, the kind of legislation that we're talking about with the Better Business Act that we're all talking about in terms of stakeholder governance, without, you know, that those legislative changes being backed up by a shifting culture to really bed bed those in and and you know make them kind of um, part of part of the new fabric of our of our economy and without the kind of disclosures and reporting that would be necessary for for accountability you know they're going to be just kind of totems you know just kind of symbols of the kind of change that we seek so there is a bit of a chicken and egg debate that goes on with 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 these things to sort of say what you know what should come first what shouldn't I think for me I come back to the I come back to policy and I come back to um the importance of um the importance of legislation on stakeholder governance not just um but I suppose first of all as a symbol because what it is is it's an articulation of what ultimately what we expect business to be doing and what the role of business should be in our in our societies um, and that kind of articulation I think um, has never been uh, certainly in most of the, the in the in the jurisdictions we're talking about it's never been deliberately and intentionally crafted you know that definition of the role of business in our societies and I think there is a huge um, need for us to do that. And I think legislating on stakeholder governance is, is the best way of doing it. Um, and, and what I think that then does is I think it then creates a real imperative for on stuff, on issues such as um, disclosures and reporting, it creates a real imperative for that landscape to be much more integrated and coherent. Um, because if every business is required, to be reported or not every, but if most businesses are required, then obviously, you know, governments and, and, and agencies which are leading on that work have an absolute um, kind of mandate to rationalise the landscape and ensure that it's as, as, as kind of um, easy, ultimately, as, as, as possible for businesses to live up to their, their responsibilities. Thank you, Chris. Now, I'm cognizant of the time I have like another 12 questions that we're not gonna be able to get to, but this has been um, fantastic to come together just to have a conversation. And most importantly, the conversation is being had in a much broader context. And that broader context is about a current threat to democracy and how we globally can come together to support our friends in the Ukraine. And so uh, I wanna reiterate where we started, Pamka. Uh, we're honored to be here, uh, your friends from uh, the B-Lab Global Network. I want to thank my fellow pal panelists, Marcel, Chris, and Paola. As always, guys, I could talk to you for hours. I'm hugely grateful for you joining us uh, and supporting our friends at Globescan and CSR EU and CSR Ukraine. Uh, 